Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Tonight, we've got our brother Greg Horwood here, and he's going to continue our studies on Micah, who is like Yah. To open, we're going to begin with hymn number 402, followed by prayer. Let's pray. Yahweh, our God and our Father dwelling in heaven, we approach before you now in prayer, giving you all praise and honour. Father, we praise you for we know you are the only one true God, the creator of all things. And yet, Father, in, in your majesty and in your power, you have shown love and grace to us. We thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, another day of life under your Son. We thank you for this time we have to meet together and to read your word recorded for us in the Bible and to learn from those believers from before us. We pray that you will be with us all here tonight. Please let us learn from your word. We pray that you'll be with our speaker. Let him expound your word. We pray that you continue to be with us throughout this week. We thank you for all things. We offer this prayer through your son's name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've got our brother Greg Horwood here tonight, speaking to the topic of Micah, who is like Yah. Hear all ye people. And to introduce this study tonight, our brother Tim McGeorge will read for us Micah chapter 2. Thanks. Micah chapter 2. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence, and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks. Neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore shalt... So, therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of Yahweh. 
Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them, that they shall not take shame. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of, the, of Yahweh straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The woman of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest, because it is polluted. It shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. If a man walking in the spirit and in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, "I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink," he shall even be the prophet of his people. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make a great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and Yahweh on the head of them. Good evening, brothers and sisters and young people. We've got an exciting uh, class ahead of us as we look at our first of the parts of the prophecy that make up Micah. But I guess just to get our mental juices into the right state, a reminder of the prophecy in one sentence. It's useful to sort of keep this perspective. This, this is the point. Godlessness does bring consequences. But God will complete his purpose with those who listen and turn back to him. And in a sense, the message is so simple, isn't it? It's such a simple message. But it's so relevant. And it's relevant to us in 2024 as it was to the people in 720 BC that Micah was prophesying to, as it has been through the faithful from literally Adam's time and will be until God is all and in all. It's a simple but a powerful message. And the reason for the prophecy is because God wants people to listen and turn back to him. That's the, that's the point of it. It's not a prophecy given because God wants to destroy the people. If he wanted that, he'd just do it. But he doesn't. He wants that response piece back to him. And that's where we're going to see the relevance. Now, again, just to, to get ourselves into the zone of where we are, there's that little exploded view of the kings and prophets of Israel and Judah. And this is the time frame we're talking about through here. Here's Micah reigning in the, the kings of Judah period, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, and prophesying at the end of the northern kingdom, which we're going to see pretty relevant through here. And there's, there's our sort of time frame that Micah prophesied in, 740, 730 BC um, for 30 or so years. Times of change, weren't they? Times of change. Ecclesially, internationally, there was a lot happening. You could almost say the signs of the times were there to see. And, and again, that's, that's relevant for us, isn't it? We're living in the same time. We're living at this point where the, the latter-day Assyrian is going to be re-established, is going to reassert its dominance. And the, the message of Micah is so relevant to us. And we live in times which are momentous, in the signs of the times that are all around us. You know, we had the common lecture title on Sunday, for example. There it is. In type, what we're considering there. And you'll remember that the prophecy of Micah really can be split into these three sub-prophecies, if you like, three parts. And, and this first one is what we're going to be looking at today. Hear, all ye people. So it's, it's really focused on Israel and Judah, the people of Israel and Judah. 
and it covers the first two chapters of Micah. Almost certainly given early on in Micah's prophecy, seems to fit chronologically with how it flows, so it makes sense that this prophecy, this part of the prophecy of Micah, that Micah gave, was given during the reign of Jotham, who was that first king. You may remember three pictures of the faces there, picked randomly off the internet, and you remember the face of Jotham, who was a king that tried to do the right thing, but the people were bad. There was this disconnect. And, and that's the period of time that Mike is prophesying in. So let's have a look at, at chapter 1 and the beginning of his prophecy. In some ways, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because there's almost, there's almost like a buffer in verse 1 of chapter 1 that to some extent softens the impact of Micah's words. Because chapter 1, verse 1, is a bit of introductory stuff, isn't it? The word of Yahweh that came to Micah, it tells us a bit about his background, where he came from, which time of period it is. That's not what the people heard. When Micah prophesied, they didn't get their introductory words like that. They get verse 2. And how does verse 2 stand? start? Hear, all ye people. Hearken, O earth, and all that there it is. Let Adonai Yahweh be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. That's it. That's their introduction. You, you sort of picture the scene, you know, rem remember our little picture of, of Micah, country prophet, bursting into the scene. All of a sudden, like, you know, can imagine people doing whatever they're doing, playing cards, I don't know, doing something. And the next minute, it's like this sudden appearance of this, as it turns out, prophet completely overwhelms what they're doing. Does it remind you of anyone? Elijah, Elijah. It's exactly the same, isn't it? Same sort of scene. Which is interesting because, of course, that was to the northern kingdom. That's Elijah prophesying to Ahab. Same thing. They're all sitting around, probably playing, you know, doing whatever they were doing at that time. And Elijah just, bang, in he comes. No dew nor rain for three years. Gone. Everyone like looking around. What was that? Well, this is a little bit the same. And that's because the message is important. It's not a it's not a gentle, let's have a bit of a think about this and sit round together and no, it's stop and listen. That's the point of the introductory part of this prophecy of Micah. Stop and listen. But, you know, there's more to Micah's opening words than just simply the stunning effect, as stunning as it would be, because Micah is quoting from someone. Come back to 1 of Kings 22. Keep your hand in, Micah, 1 of Kings 22. Now, this is fascinating, because this is in the context of the same king that Elijah prophesied to, King Ahab, in the northern kingdom, about 150 years before Micah's time. And I'm sure you're familiar with the background, but remember, you know, Ahab goes to fight and, and he asks for Jehoshaphat to help him. And, you know, remember the story about the prophets and, you know, Ahab just wanted all the, all the prophets had told him what he wanted. And Jehoshaphat said, oh, I think we should ask a prophet of Yahweh. And, oh, all right then. And they, they get this prophet who, when he prophesies what wants to hear, gets told, no, don't do that, you've got to tell me what God says. You know, it's like the classic no-win situation. That's, that's the background to this. And you may remember the story that Ahab, when, Mike, when the prophet, I'm not going to say who just yet, when the prophet prophesies the words of Yahweh, remember he does that little parable? The, here's the angel sitting around, God with them. Verse 20, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And they come up with their different plans and one comes and says, I'm going to be a lying spirit. And, and God says in this, this vision, oh, that would all succeed. And Ahab in verse 26 says, take this prophet and lock him up, verse 27, and feed him with bread of affliction, with water of affliction, until I come in peace. And, says the prophet, if thou return at all in peace, Yahweh hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, 
O oh people, every one of you. That's the same expression. So what was the prophet in 1 Kings 22? Well, I kept skipping over the name, but you can see it. It's the same, isn't it? The prophet Micaiah, who's speaking the message to Ahab. And he finishes the message calling upon everyone to listen as the proof that his words that he was saying were the words of God. Hearken, all ye people, every one of you. And in Micah, prophet with the same name, begins his message in the same way. Hearken, every one of you. It's, there's these beautiful echoes that you get. Micah, in, the, in 150 years early in the time of Ahab, Micah to Judah, voice echo. And we know they're the same. I mean, there's, there's just a little screenshot from uh, um, Esau. And you can see it's exactly the same words that are used. You might not be able to see back there, but you know, the same Hebrew words. Hearken, O people, every one of you. Hear, all ye people. Exactly the same thing. We get the slightly variation in the English because the translators are translating it. So it's exactly the same. The same expression that's being used. One is the words of Micah. One is the words of Micah. One is the last recorded words. One is the first recorded words. One, Micah was talking in the context of an ungodly alliance between Israel and Judah. Remember that? Jehoshaphat's where he shouldn't be, doing what he shouldn't be doing, aligning himself with Ahab, which God told him was the wrong thing. It's only God's mercy that he saved him out of that. Well, Micah's message is, is the same, isn't it? The context of this common ungodly behaviour between Israel and Judah. We saw that in our first study, didn't we? They're aligned. They're alike, alikened, if that's a word. We're going to see that a bit more as we look through this in more detail. And do you know, the fulfilment of Micaiah's prophecy testified to its divine origin. His appeal, his calling out, testified to the fact that this was God's message. Listen, every one of you. If he comes back, God hasn't spoken by me. Does everyone, can everyone hear that? Says Micah. Well, that became the basis, isn't it, for the beginning point of the prophet Micah. What he was going to say had the same divine origin and would surely be fulfilled. And that's, that's the point of it. It's as interesting it is as same names and same message and stuff. The point is, this is God's work working through there. The same challenge, the same message was delivered to both the northern kingdom and now to the southern kingdom. Because as we shall see, the southern kingdom was fast going down the same path as the northern kingdom. And then if we come back to Micah, in, in chap, the end of that verse, verse 2 of Micah chapter 1, Micah says, Let Adonai Yahweh be witness against you. Now this is a little bit of a consistent approach that Micah does here. Isaiah also does quite similar in quite a few chapters of Isaiah, where, where God uses this sort of courtroom type language to challenge the people. So, you know, this, we all get the idea of a witness, I assume. You know, you, witnesses are called, aren't they? And a witness comes forward and provides evidence. I, you know, I saw so-and-so on such-and-such such doing whatever. Oh, right. Well, God's going to use this idea of calling witnesses because the consequences are going to be appropriate for the behaviour of the people. It's, it, it's just an interesting little... If you switch across to chapter 6, you see the same thing again. So chapter 6 of Micah is the third part of his prophecy. And you get this same idea of a witness. You know, um, 
verse 1. Arise, contend thou before the mountains. Let the hills hear thy voice. Hear, O mountains, Yahweh's controversy. Strong, Yahweh, the controversy. He's going to plead with his people. What have I done to thee? Where have I weary thee? Testify against me, says God. So, so this idea of using almost like a courtroom scene to, to paint the logic of the issue is used by God a lot. It's almost like you put it in terms of sort of a prosecution and a defence supported by witnesses and it's a bit hard to argue the conclusion that's reached. That's, that's the point of this sort of style of reasoning. So here they are. There's, there's a witness piece. There's going to be, there's going to be appropriate consequences for their behaviour. And what is, what is the consequence going to be? Have a look at verses 3 and 4. God's going to come forth out of his place. He's going to tread upon the high places of the earth. And verse 4 just describes a volcano, doesn't it? That was the, that was the mental image I got anyway, as, as I was reading. The mountains shall be molten under him. The valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire as the waters that are poured down a steep place. And, and here you've got this sort of picture of all the things that are solid in this world, mountains and the rocks and, and all the substantial things, and they're just disappearing before God, this volcano of God's judgment on the people was going to be unstoppable. Waters poured out to a deep place, this molten lava as God stamps out and stamps down those places of idolatry. And it is God's work. It is God's work. Have a look at verses 5 to 7. The problem is the people are transgressing. They're following in the same idolatrous practices as the northern kingdom. You see that there? The transgression of Jacob is all this. For the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So, so the southern kingdom's just being like the northern kingdom. They're adopting the idolatrous practices and that's what God's going to deal with. And you can see God's work in this space. If it's worth colouring in. Colouring the sort of eye wheels that come through verse 6 7. This is God's work. Therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley. And I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images shall be beaten to pieces and the hires will be burned with fire. And all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, says God. It's like God's personally supervising it. That's what it is, isn't it? He's not sort of sending it by some third party or subcontracting it out for someone else to do. God's not doing that. He's doing it. Personally supervising it. You know, while this prophecy is describing both the northern and the southern kingdom, because it is, and at this point in time, in Jotham's if you remember our little chart here, in Jotham's time, the northern kingdom was still there. Not for very long, but it was still there. The reality is that Micah's prophecy is primarily directed at the southern kingdom. He's appealing to the southern kingdom. That's where the greatest opportunity for change was. And Samaria is covered in incurable wounds. We know that from verse 9. Samaria's wound is incurable. Its destruction was inevitable. But Judah had opportunity for change. But the change, that opportunity window, was limited. And this is the point God's saying. Your window for opportunity is limited. You're heading down the same pathway, Judah. You know, hence the, the starting point. Stop, stop, hearken, hear all you people. At this point in time... Jerusalem was just as worthy of destruction as Samaria, but they had opportunity. And God's trying to appeal to that and work to it. And we saw, we saw in our opening study, in verse 8, this beautiful insight that we have into the man Micah, the prophet Micah. You know, he's, he's done a fairly impressive start to his prophecy, hasn't he? If you were listening there, you would have, you, no one would have been falling asleep in the first phase of Micah's prophecy. He's come out all guns blazing, 
God's going to heal all you people. God's going to do this. It's going to be like a molten lava going through. And then he cries. And then he cries. A wail and howl. Go stripped and naked. I'll make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. Because of what's happening to his people. Isn't that such a beautiful thing? Such a beautiful thing. His personal and his emotional response to the words. As we, as we saw before, he didn't, he didn't mince his words, he didn't change them, he didn't adjust them. We're going to see later on that that's in chapter 2, that's one of the problems with the people. The people wanted to hear words they wanted to hear. Mike is not like that. Mike is giving the words they needed to hear, which is different from the words they wanted to hear. But he had an empathy for them, which takes us back to our Lord, doesn't it? Takes us back to our Lord. What a, what a magnificent thing that is. True sign of God-likeness when the message can be delivered. But the spirit behind the message is one of saving, which is the case with Micah. And the situation was dire, wasn't it? 1 verse 9, it's dire, it's dire. Samaria has an incurable disease. It's a fatal disease. And the worst thing about it is it's catching. That's what he says, isn't it? It's catching. It's catching. Her, Samaria's wound is incurable and has come unto Judah. Judah is catching the disease. And, and then in verses 10 to 16, we get this absolutely incredible description of how the response, how that lava overflow, how that explosion that God was talking about before, the it, the, the rocks melting, how that was going to happen. How was it going to happen? What, was it going to be an actual earthquake? No, no. God describes what's going to happen. And it's absolutely fascinating. Terrifying. Terrifying if you're living there. But fascinating to see how God brought this about. And it, the section that God's going to use to describe this event begins in verse 10. It's all still part of the first prophecy. It's all still part of describing the consequences of their godlessness as manifested in Judah who had caught the disease of Samaria. And it starts in verse 10. And, and it's, it's like this appeal, isn't it? It's, it reminded me again of, of what David said at, at the death of, of Saul and of Jonathan. He, he starts off, tell it not in Gath. You know, he, he's Gath, the, the home of the enemies of Israel. Philistine location, you know, the symbolic of the flesh in all its ways. And, and he starts with tell it not in Gath because he's going to describe this, what is going to be an inexorable, unstoppable, step-by-step -step destruction that is going to come there. And it's literally described in terms of some places. Declare it, you're not in Gath. Weep ye not at all. In the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. And what he goes on to describe here, and I'm, and I'm going to just sort of flick it up on the screen to demonstrate the point that's being made, is he describes ten locations, one after the other. And they're ten locations that are all in the foothills of Judah. Now, some of them we can't be 100% sure where they are. On the bottom of the slide, I've put the references I use to try and find them. But look at this, Aphra, around about there. -ish. So, so remember, there's Jerusalem, sort of getting our point, uh, point. You may remember that Micah lives in this region here, that sort of region of the Shephelah, that transition from the plain into the mountains. And have a look at this. Picture this like footsteps, like giant footsteps. Tell it not in Aphra. The next one's Safer. Pass your way, thou inhabitant of Safer. There or thereabouts. The next one is Zanain. Zanan, come not forth in the morning of Beth Ezel. See the footsteps? Walking up. It's footstep by footstep. 
for the inhabitant of Mayroth. There it is. Waited carefully for good, but evil came down from Yoan to the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, Behind the chariot to the swift beast, she is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore thou shalt give presents to Morasheth Gath. The house of Axib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marashah. He shall come to Adullam. Can you see them like steps? Like giant footprints? You know, if you sort of go back, like, you know, step, 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 step. And where are they heading? They're inexorably heading to Jerusalem. And like this great volcanic activity, God's describing the march of the Assyrians towards Jerusalem. That's what happened. That's what happened. They came up. City by city. Destruction by destruction. Closer and closer to Jerusalem. Can you sort of sense the the tension, the fear that would have been associated with that? But yeah, there's an interesting thing there. You'll see I've got, I've got the names against them. There is absolutely no doubt that, that the prophet is picking up the names. You would have seen that as we went through it. So again, um, I've got here some references where, because it's not always easy finding the meaning of names and stuff like that, and some sort of have varying degrees. But I'm utterly convinced that every one of these names is applicable. And the reason it is, is because you can see how they come. Declare it not in Gath, that's the opening statement. Weep not at all. In the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. Well, if you look in the margin, the margin says the meaning of Aphra is dust. So you sort of see this little play on there, isn't it? Dust. Roll thyself not in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Safer. Well, that word means glittering, sparkling, you know, something that's impressive. Having thy shame naked. There's no glittering there, is there? There's no jazzy ball gown that they're wearing. It's the opposite. And every single one of these things has an applicability to that. Inhabitant of Zainan, marching to go forth. Well, he, he didn't come to the morning. He's not marching. He's not come forth to the morning of Beth Ezel, which means a house joined. All the way through, God does it. And I'm not going to go through each one of those. Just look at verse 13. It's an obvious and classic one, and we're going to touch on Lachish in just a minute anyway. But have a look at this. Oh, thou inhabitant of Lachish. Well, that means horse. Bind the chariot to the swift beast. Because you've just done the sins of the kingdom in the north. So get on your fastest horse. Effectively, is what God's saying. And, and, and why? Why? Who cares? Who cares? Why does the meaning of the names and the, the, you know, this sort of counter, uh, counter association, we might say, you know, counter meaning that comes out of the prophecy, why is that? Who do we, why do we even care about it? Well, I think it's because God's making the point that when we turn away from Him, everything everything that we stood for before is going to be overturned. It's going to be turned around. It's going to be the opposite. It's going to be counter to what we wanted. So, you know, you can imagine all the hopes and the aspirations as those cities were being built. You know, the people that came and settled in an area and they thought it was going to be great and, and, and you know, let's call it glittering. All of that comes to nothing if we're not aligned with God. The end result is the opposite. It's turned around. It's nakedness, in the case of Safer. See how it sort of works? It's it's not just God doing it because he's clever, although he is, 
and can do that kind of stuff. It's doing it to emphasise the point. The point is the best laid plans of men, the aspirations, the hopes, all those things that we stand for, everything that we think is great, is nothing if we don't have God. And we're not aligned to that. And that's, that's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? That's a, that is a message that's as applicable today as it's ever been. You know, the benefit of hindsight, which we have been quite some distance from those times, we know, we know that verses 10 through to 16 is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. Assyria came up, just like in a volcano, and overtook those cities. But this prophecy is a prophecy. When Micah gives this first part, part the first, he's talking in the reign of Jotham. The fulfilment of this prophecy wasn't to Hezekiah's time, some 30 years later. But can you see in the prophecy that is here in Micah that there's, there's a a fear, there's an urgency, there's a need to change and respond to this thing that's going to happen that makes it feel like you're really there, it makes it feel like this. As you're reading it, you're, sort of, you're there, you can see what's happening. Yeah, it's a great lesson for us in that. When Christ has returned and God willing we're in the kingdom and we're looking back, maybe it's on 2024, we look and say, look at those prophecies. Daniel 2, Ezekiel 38, you know, Daniel 7, 11. But look at the prophecies. Revelation. So urgent. Couldn't they see that, that well, couldn't we see that Christ was going to return in 2024? But it's not so easy when you're there, is it? It's not so easy when you're, when you're not looking back with hindsight. You're, you're there, you're before the event. We know that, we know we're living in those times now. Come across the second of Peter. Second of Peter picks up. We know the, the quote so well, but it's, it's so relevant that it's worth us just reminding ourselves of this quote. So, you know, it's a characteristic of the end of all ages that prophecies appear to be no more than possible outcomes and they're always, always just beyond the foreseeable future. That, that's the challenge, isn't it, with prophecies? They're, they're, we wouldn't say that, of course, but it's easy to think that they're... Oh, they're going to happen. Yeah, yeah, they'll happen but they're just beyond the foreseeable future. Well, Peter picks that up, doesn't he? Second of Peter, chapter 3, verse 2. It says, That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Well, that's what Mike is one of them. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, knowing this first there shall come in the last days, and we could almost say that's the, that's the last days of every period of time. It's particularly applicable to our time, but it's true for the end of all ages. There'll be scoffers. Where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The, you know, the people in Noah's time, they thought the same thing, didn't they? They thought the same thing. And one day... God shut the door of the ark. Seven days later, still shut. The rain started. And that's the warning. That is the warning. Be not ignorant, he says, verse 8, of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some then count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, though that all should come to repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And isn't this a classic? 
I mean, if, if we were writing that, I would, I would probably say, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night because it will be quiet. And someone will sneak in and you won't hear them. That's not what it says, is it? It's the opposite. It's the opposite. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are there shall be burned up. You've got this enormous manifestation of, of God's judgments on the earth. But it's coming as a thief in the night because by the time that loud noise happens, as it were, by the time the, it's obviously apparent that God has acted, well, then it's too late. That's the point, isn't it? That's the point. That was the point in Noah's time. There were an awful lot of genuine converts banging on the door of the ark when the water was up to their waist and rising. But not so many. Just eight. When there was no sign at all. And that's, that's the warning for us, brothers and sisters. That is the warning for us. This prophecy in Micah was going to eventuate and it would be with a harsh and a brutal reality. Come back to 2nd of Kings 18. Because 2nd of Kings 18 is the fulfilment of this prophecy. And again, don't lose track of the, the fact that there's 30 odd years between the prophecy in Micah chapter 1 and 2 and the fulfilment in 2nd of Kings chapter 18. Because when we get to 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah is the king ruling. And, and we read about him in the beginning of chapter 18. What a God, it's so good, isn't it? You get to this in the daily readings, and it's oh, relief, relief. We like reading this bit. How good is he? He starts reigning, he's 25 years old. That which is right in verse 3. Look at verse 4, he's removing high places and getting rid of the sprays and serpent that have become a Come an idol. Verse 5, the summary. He trusted in Yahweh, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. That's, that's, not, a bad, that's not a bad reference, is it? Divine reference. For he clave to Yahweh. He departed not from following him, and kept his commandments, which Yahweh commanded Moses. And Yahweh was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. Brilliant. That's what, that's what a godly man does, we say. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. And we say, bravo, don't we? Well done, Hezekiah. There's a good example of faith. And then the Assyrians come. And then the Assyrians come. Now, God was with him. He's a remarkable man. I'm not for one instance taking away anything from what Hezekiah did. It was absolutely the right thing to do. It was what God wanted him to do. But, but God prospering him in everything that he did also meant that the Assyrians were coming. And what happens when they come? Verse 9 came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. How would you be feeling if you were Hezekiah? Whew, at least they've gone to Samaria first. A bit rough for Samaria. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe everything will be okay. Verse 10, the end of three years they took it. Now we're in the sixth year of Hezekiah. The king of Assyria, verse 11, to carry away Israel unto Assyria. You know, if you imagine, put yourself in the, in the shoes of Hezekiah at this point in time, what would you be doing? You would be, you would be Remy, you've rebelled. You rebelled at the beginning of your reign. Four years, Assyrians rock up to your brothers and sisters in the northern, you know, the next ecclesia, as it were. And then they're defeated. Imagine, imagine how Hezekiah would feel. 
and then they go. I mean, you would be thinking if you're Hezekiah, we're in for it. But they go. And then in verse 13, they're back. Eight years later, the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah? There it is. Now's the fulfilment of Micah chapter 1, verses 10 to 15. He came up against all the fenced cities of Judah. And you know what? He, he's this faithful king. Is he a faithful king? Yes, he's a faithful king. There's none like him before or afterwards. That's the divine peace. What should happen to faithful kings? Assyria should be stopped on the border. But they're not. He takes the cities. To me, that, that what a trial of faith that would be to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, Hezekiah's in Jerusalem. He's up here. And he can see Assyria coming. And one by one, the fenced cities of Judah are going. They're going. He's getting closer. The footsteps are coming. The torrent of lava is coming. See the, the, the imagery there? And, and it's, there's no escape. Nothing can stop them. Nothing can stop them. You know, we know a lot about the Assyrians from an archaeological perspective. There's uh, reading a few books. One of them said, you know, the Assyrian army was a magnificent and successful war machine. But have a look at the beginning of that statement. Aggressive, murderously vindictive. That's who you've got coming up. That's lava in a serious way. Yeah, there's some, some pictures. I'm sure some of you have seen these in the British Museum. We were lucky enough to see them last year. And you know, it's one thing to see them on a picture when you see them physically there. These are the reliefs that were made to commemorate the destruction of Lachish and, and they've been excavated and they're shown up there. They're not made up. They're, not, they're, they're literally what it's done. And we've got a beheading. We've got a skinning alive. We have an impaling. And this is the scenes of Lachish. Lachish was a kingdom, it was a town in Judah. Lachish was the next door neighbours from Micah's hometown. He knew people, presumably, from Lachish. And that's what's happening. You know, there's a uh, book, Realm of History, it says... There was more to the scope of Assyrian brutality than sheer terror. Most of these punitive campaigns were usually conducted for, so this, mitigating rebellions that fumed around corners of Assyria. So in a sense, the very nature of these brutal actions and punishments acted as a counter to the restlessness and apparent disorganised scope of the rebels and potential rebels. The Assyrians did this to put off rebellion. That's why they did it. Everybody, if you rebel, we do this to you. And that is what Hezekiah had done. You know, again, he did the right thing. He, he's, he's commended in the record for doing the right thing by rebelling, but... but it's one, thing, it's one thing to have you know, a theoretical faith, isn't it? It's one thing to have a theoretical faith. It's another thing to have a practical faith. And this is, this is a practical faith. And we can see what, what happened with Hezekiah. Have a look at verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I've offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. See, by this stage, the king of Assyria is in Lachish. This place, doing this. 
not in a really good bargaining position, are you, when you've rebelled and you're being found out, you can't really bargain for a good deal. And he's like, oh, I has to give him all the silver that's found in the house of Yah and the treasures of the king's house. And he cuts the gold from the doors of the temple of Yahweh, from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid. And he's giving it to this king of Assyria. The earlier spirit of rebellion is gone, isn't it? Oh, are we critical of, about being he- critical of Hezekiah? No, no, we're not being critical of Hezekiah. Amazing man of faith, but that's reality, isn't it? That's faith being tested. And you can't help but feel that sheer terror as like those footsteps of doom, that ruthless, that vindictive regime destroy the city by city. So let's come back to Micah chapter 2. Yeah, Micah 2 is part of the same prophecy. Ignore the chapter division. Not there. Micah chapter 1 was the description of what God was going to do. The consequence of their action. Micah chapter 2 is why God was going to do what he's going to do. See, it's the difference between the two. You know, Micah chapter 1 is going to be the consequence, but then God goes on to describe why that would be the case. Describes how far the people had moved from God. And what were they like? Well, let's have a look at verse 1 and 2 of Micah chapter 2. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it's in the power of their hands. See, see this saying, these busy people, remember he's talking about people of Judah, who'd caught some areas incurable disease. They're busy, 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 busy. All night long. Working out iniquity, staying up late, plotting, planning evil upon their beds. As soon as it's day, they're up. No sleeping in here. They're putting into action their evil deeds because they've got power in their hands. Yeah, that word power is interesting. If you've done you know, the old name and titles, colouring in, you'll see it's actually the word ale. Normally used for God, isn't it? Yeah, God, ale, power. Here, their God, their power is their hand, their hand, their hand to do what they want, when they want to work out the iniquity that they were planning on their beds. They worship the works of their own hands. And look how far away they were from God. Verse 2, they're covetous, they covet fields. Oh, boy, I could do with that. They take them by violence. And houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Oh, who does that remind you of? Anyone want to take his? Yes. Naboth. See, Judah was like Israel. That's the point that Mike is making here. Don't think you're all holy and, you know, you're in a different class of spirituality from your sister that's up the north. You're just the same. Micah's message to the people of Judah is almost identical to Elijah's message, and Micah's message, to Ahab and the people around Ahab in his time. It's exactly what Ahab did. Coveted Naboth's vineyard, took it by violence, oppressed a man in his house, even a man and his heritage, even the bit that associated a man with God, his inheritance, the relationship with God. How do you get like that? How do you get like that? Right, make a note for yourself of Psalm 36. We won't go there because I've just suddenly looked at how fast the clock's going back there. So have a look at Psalm 36. You know, Psalm 36 is such a powerful one. David who writes, and it describes the downward, the downward trend that happens by a wicked man. And, and the point of, that David makes in that section is that it comes because people cease to believe in God. There is no fear of God before his eyes. That's the root cause. When we stop believing in God, then we become like that. 
or a manifestation of that. Perhaps not that extreme, but ultimately, so far as God is concerned, we, we are, we are separated from him. And then he goes on. Now, this section from like verse 3 to verse 11 is, is quite tricky in the authorised version. Um, the ESV, for example, makes it a whole lot easier. It's a lot easier to understand this. So I'm sort of going to take you through this section, and I'll do it fairly quickly just from a timing point of view, and picking up how the ESV picks it up. Um, you know, verses 3 and 4... God's really saying, just like you devised, you people of Judah, just, uh, just like you devised disaster against others, in verse 2, so I'm going to devise disaster against you. See, there's that witness piece, isn't it? There's the, there's the logic of the consequence that God was going to bring upon them. And it didn't matter in verse 5, it doesn't matter how much you might sort of have clever lawyer tactics, nothing is going to avert the disaster. The ESV says for verse 5, therefore you have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of Yahweh. Now here they were using legal tactics to achieve what it is, and God says, well, they're not going to succeed. Because you're fighting against me. And I am devising evil against the people who have created evil for their brothers and sisters, coveted their land, taken them by violence. And then we have, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this, then we have the response of the people to the words of God. So, so in a sense, it's, it's the accusation that God levels against them, their behaviours, their violence, they turned away from him, what they use to try and achieve their own ends... And the people, as it were, listening to this, and then they respond in verse 6 and 7. And have a look at what they say. Oh, is this, is this relevant? This is extremely relevant. Do not preach, say the people to Micah. Do not preach, thus they preach, one should not preach of such thing. Disgrace will not overtake us. Is that what they're saying? Mike is prophesying on behalf of God. He's, he's listening. It's well before the events happened. Well before the events happened. Mike is listening these things up and the people are listening to that. And they say, you can't say that. You shouldn't be preaching about that. Disgrace is not going to overtake us. And then the ESV, and there's clearly some of the translations sort of struggle with trying to get who's saying what at which point in time. And then it's like, almost as if God's saying, well, should this be said? O house of Jacob, has Yahweh grown impatient? Are these his deeds? I find, and Bible and basic English is not necessarily always the greatest translation, but, but I think it really picks up the point. This is still part of their response. This is what the people say. Let not words like these be dropped, they say. Shame and the curse will not come to the family of Jacob. Is the Lord quickly made angry? Are these his doings? Do not his words do good to his people Israel? That's a warning, isn't it? We can interpret God through a lens of humanism. Yet, yeah, humanism cannot accept a God with absolute rights and wrongs. Can't accept it. So even religions have to, to move away from standing up for principles. Ah, well, you know, it sort of means this, but not quite that. And, and that's the warning of, of, this is what the people in Micah's time were saying. This is, this is what they were responding back to Micah. Micah gives these prophecies and they're like, ah, no. Downplaying the righteousness and jealousy. If God would understand God wouldn't expect you to do whatever. You can't help being this. See, that, that's the sentiment of that, isn't it? That's the sentiment of that. Downplaying what God says. God's not like bringing judgment. That's our world. That's what the world says. You know, it seems nice, doesn't it? It seems like the nice thing to say. But it's the same 
as the serpent's lie in the Garden of Eden. Thou shalt not surely die. That seems a whole lot more nice than in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, doesn't it? Which one would you like to pick? Oh, I think I'll pick the thou shalt not surely die. That's much nicer. True, but it's not right. It's wrong. So ultimately, it's not nice. It's destructive. And that is the lesson for us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? That is the lesson for us. It's easy for us to interpret God through a lens of humanism. And God is not a man. And his consequences, his conclusions will work themselves out. And then he goes on, and um, I literally am out of time, so I'm just going to uh, pop that up on the screen there. But this was the problem. They had itching ears. We know where the concept of itching ears is picked up, isn't it, in, in the New Testament. Paul speaks about it. Timothy. We like having our ears itched. I like to hear what I want to hear. Heaps better than hearing what you don't want to hear. But not as useful. And that is the point that goes on there. And, then, and what ends up happening is, is God cuts through the niceness and you know all of this, the, the sort of fluff and things that we do to, to obscure our true motives. And he gets to the key point. Actually, the people who were selling the people what they wanted to hear were stripping the clothes off those who passed by trustingly with no thought of war. So all these people innocently going on to hear. And in actual fact, what was happening? Well, these prophets that they had were becoming rich at the expense of the people. And again, the lesson for us is so great. I just want to finish quickly by this last little bit. It's such a wonderful section. We did touch on this in the, in the uh, opening study. But that section from verse 12 to 13, which is, as per all the parts, is the section associated with deliverance. All of those terrible things in Micah 1 and 2. But then God finishes with this vision of, of future glory. And it's, we, we touched on it before anyway, so you know, we can... We could sort of get the picture, I think, seen. And the ESV picks it up so beautifully, doesn't it? Here's, the, here's this vision. Here's this, this parable of the people. The remnant of Israel. Sheep in a fold. Noisy multitude of men milling around. But one's going to come and open the breach. Make the breach. Open the way. And their king goes out before them. And, and I just want to finish by having a look at how this actually came to pass in such a beautiful way. We know the story again with the, there's the Assyrians. They go up, they surround, they surround Hezekiah. They surround Hezekiah in Jerusalem. At the same time, his faith is tested yet again because he, he's, he's sick unto death. But have a look at 2 Kings chapter 19. Now again, remember this section in verses 12 and 13 of Micah chapter 2 is well 30 odd years before, well actually probably more, than when these events happen in 2nd of Kings chapter 19. But look how accurately the prophecy comes to pass when God does it. In just the same way that that, that lava flow, the inexorable steps of the Assyrians going up to Jerusalem, in the same way that that happened, so the deliverance piece in its first manifestation was seen as well. And in 2 Kings chapter 19, picture this. This is Hezekiah. He's, he's, he's captured. He's like one of the sheep. And he's, and he's barring, isn't he? He's crying out, verse 19. Now therefore, O Yahweh our God, 2 Kings 19, verse 19, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand. That's a sheep's voice, if ever there was one, isn't it? Hezekiah is just speaking on behalf of all the people. They're stuck, they're trapped, they're locked in. There's this, this gate around them, they're in the fold. They've got no leader in that sense, not one that can save them anyway. And what happens? God's reply. That's just wonderful, we don't have time to read the whole lot, but here it comes, verse 20. Isaiah comes in and says, He's heard. 
He's heard the cry of the sheep. Thus saith Yahweh, God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me against the Nacarib, I have heard. See, there it is. There's the leader. There's the, the breaker. And he's going to come out and the whole of that section is just like this power, power. This is God on their, on their side. Verse 30. The remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Isn't that beautiful? There, there's the same terminology, the remnant in Micah 2 verse 12. The remnant here in 2 Kings 19 verse 30. For, says God in verse 34, for I will defend this city and to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the breaker, the angel of Yahweh, went out and he smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. When they arose in the morning, oh, they're dead. For all their marvellous ways, for all their power, for all their inexorable moving, for the fact they destroyed all the nations, they're gone because the breaker can break. God's tougher than anyone. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Oh, to me, that's such a that's such a great. We're, that's the God we've got. That's the God we've got on our side. When you've got God like that on your side, it doesn't matter who is locking us in, who's surrounding us, trapping us. Puny, they're weak. One night, bang, God sends his angel, 185,000 dead. Isn't that a magnificent thing? Magnificent. Yeah, it's wonderful to see in, in the time of Hezekiah. It's wonderful to see the fulfilment of Micah 2, verse 12 to, to 13. But, you know, we're just as much in need of deliverance as the people in Hezekiah's day were. We're just as much as are all the mortals since Adam, including those saved in Hezekiah's time, isn't it? Yeah, sure, good news. The Syrians are gone. Hezekiah and the people can go out, but, but where are they now? Well, they're all dead, aren't they? The last great enemy got them. Sure, Syria didn't get them, but the last great enemy got them. And that is what this is all pointing forward to. This is the thing. The ultimate adversary is going to be destroyed by that breaker. And we're besieged. We're locked in, aren't we? We're locked into certain death. Or apparent certain death. But we've got the breaker on our side. We've got the breaker at our head. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, he's broken through the barriers of sin and death and he leads out his sheep, us, to their salvation. And that's why we need to listen to his words, even when it's challenging, even when it's, it's, it's not what we might want to hear. Because if we listen to his words, we hear his voice when he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Thank you, Brother Greg. You've certainly brought out some great encouragements and lessons and warnings that's very applicable for us even in our day today. We're going to just have the announcements. These announcements for our ecclesial activities, uh, which will continue, God willing. On Friday night, there is to be a Northern Youth Group class held at the Enfield Hall at 8pm. And Brother Jamin Richards will be speaking on the musician. Next Sunday, school, we've got uh, Sunday school at 9am, <coughs> memorial meeting at 10.30am, exhorter is Brother John Evans, chairman, Brother Colin Warner, pianist, Sister Belinda Dyer, Rita Stewart One, Brother Jesse Bruce. There is to be an ecclesial lunch on Sunday, so if we could each bring a meal and dessert ready for the table, group one will be taking care of catering. Sunday afternoon, 2pm, presenter will be Brother Luke Heinemann with the subject, Meet Your Members. 
And following the afternoon activity, there is an AB meeting and all are welcome to attend. Next Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m., once again, we've got our brother Greg Horwood to continue his series on Micah. The chairman is brother Max Caslin, reader, brother Hayden Shaw, tea and coffee, sister Lynn Derricky. We'll now close with hymn number nine, followed by prayer. Our Father in heaven, we approach before you now once again in prayer. Father, we have seen in your word, in the times before us, how you have called out to your people. You have given a warning and your words were true. Father, we thank you for being plain, for being true and recording your plan before us. We pray that you will give us the strength and the will to continue on and to read your word and to understand what is required of us. We pray that you will be with our ecclesia here at Golden Grove and indeed all ecclesias around the world. Help us to encourage each other to hold fast and stand strong to that day when your son will return to this earth. We pray that in that day when your son returns, you'll find us ready and waiting we pray that you will provide us with your grace and that we will all have a position in your kingdom to come. Great God, please be with our ecclesia, be with our members who are suffering the effects of this mortal body. We pray that you will provide us with ways to assist them in their walk. And we long for that day when your son returns. We pray that this will be even now. But Father, let it, this return be according to your will. And we offer this prayer for your son's name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>